Hi, welcome to our webinar on an introduction to speech and language and communication needs in the secondary classroom. My name is Nick Shigog and I'm a speech and language therapist on the School Age team. And my name is Kate Clements and I'm also a speech and language therapist in the School Age team. Um, and we'd like to invite you to get grab a pen and paper. There will be times where we pause, ask you to pause the webinar and just jot down your thoughts. Um, and just to let you know that there will be a copy of all the slides that we use available for you at the end. So what are our aims of this webinar? Well, we aim to help you understand the impact of having a speech, language and communication need in a classroom such as your own. To help you recognise those students presenting with a speech and language and communication need. And also to consider strategies that you can use for supporting those students in your classroom. Start with considering what is communication. So have a think about a conversation that you had this morning or last night. What did you need to do in order to communicate? What skills did you need? How did you make that communication successful or not? Pause the video and jot down some thoughts. It is so much more complicated than you think, isn't it? It's not just the words that you say. Communication is often referred to as a communication chain and as speech and language therapists we're interested in breaking this down into its constituent parts and just to show the complexity of what's actually happening when you're communicating. So if we just talk through this diagram here, right at the bottom we can see we need to be able to look and attend. All of, this, all of the material on the left is indicating input or understanding and all of the material on the right is uh, about outputs for what you're saying. So going back over to the left, we need to be able to look and attend to somebody speaking, for example. And next, we need to be able to interpret the nonverbal communication. It's quite a crucial part of communication and successful communication. Things such as body language and facial expression, tone of voice. We then need, we need to be able to hear and actually listen to what they're saying. And after that, we actually then need to remember what's been said as well. We need to understand the words and then we need to understand the sentence structure, the grammar. Is it happened in the past? Is it in the passive? And then we need to understand the meaning as a whole. So is this literally what they meant or is there some implied meaning there, some irony or some sarcasm? We are then going to decide about how we respond. In order to do that, we're going to choose the words to express the meaning we want to express. We're then going to choose the sentence structure, so the order in which those words are going to be put together so they make sense. And after that, we're going to uh, select the individual sounds that are going to make up those words that we're then going to send lots and lots of instructions for those quite complex and small movements that involved in actually um, producing those sounds and sequencing them together in a way that somebody else can actually understand. <clears throat> we're going to be speaking sort of fairly fluently, although we can stammer and still be a successful communicator. And then we'll be monitoring for what we've said as well. It's like, oh, did it actually mean that? Or well, maybe I just need to change that word. So there's an awful lot that's going on. And therefore, we can also see that there are many different levels on which it can break down. So what is a speech and language and communication need? Well, this is a term given to describe the extensive range of needs related to all aspects of communication from understanding others to forming sounds, words and sentences to express ideas and emotions and using language socially. We also can sometimes refer to these in terms of speech. So using the right sound in the right place in a word, language, understanding the meaning of words and using them to talk and communication. So the two way process using speech and language and so much more, including eye contact, turn taking and body language to express ourselves. So very small children learn language, don't they? They start to develop language. 
But actually, language does develop continually throughout secondary school as students grow older. Um, the language that they need starts to get more complicated. So there's continuing development of the understanding of more complex language, longer sentences, more complicated grammar, subordinate clauses and all of that. Um, there's, you know, they're, they're starting to understand figurative language better, sarcasm, wordplay, all those words which mean one, say one thing, but mean something different. They start to understand multiple meanings. Um, so understanding that words can mean different things. <clears throat> Students are often learning between seven and 10 new vocabulary items a day. So think about all the subject specific words that you have in your in your subject and that you're teaching in your classroom. There's so much more vocabulary that's needed um, as children go into secondary school and start going into different lessons and different uh, uh, different subjects. Narratives start to become more detailed, more interesting. Students become more aware of engaging the listener and they're able to alter their language style according to the situation. So knowing that you say different things to your peers than, than how you would, would greet a teacher. Um, and students start to use language to persuade, to motivate, to negotiate more successfully. So learning how to get yourself out of trouble, learning how to explain what's happened in the, in the playground and how it really wasn't your fault. Now, langu a language disorder is one of the most common but least recognised childhood disorders. And 10% of students will actually have a long term speech, language and communication need. Um, and 7% of students will actually have um, speech, language and communication as their main or primary difficulty. And this is now known as developmental language disorder, which is a reasonably new term, which we're going to be talking a bit more about later. Um, so it's a lifelong neurodevelopmental condition, um, but language disorders are also associated with other things. So for example, if you have ASD, autism, you may also have language difficulties. If you have a hearing loss, you may also have language difficulties, you know, and Down syndrome and other developmental uh, disorders. Um, so it's, it's very common. Um, and often um, this last point, some people's difficulties actually only emerge in secondary school due to the increasing demands that um, that is placed on their language, both socially and academically. <clears throat> this is a slide which we want you to um, pause in a moment. Um, but before we do, I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions about it. The first question is, um, do any of these um, statistics shock you? Um, do any of these statistics kind of ring true for any of the students that you're working with? Um, and which is the one that surprises you um, the most? So just pause the video for a moment and just have a look at those. Something else that's really quite important about speech and language and communication needs in the secondary school is the link between language and literacy. <clears throat> if you have good language skills, you're likely to have good literacy skills. So if your language is impaired, then it's like you're, likely your literacy skills will be too. Younger children's language tends to develop through the spoken language they're exposed to as they experience the world. But as children go older, the language continues to develop, but this is more often through wider reading, educational exposure and social experiences. Research shows that many children and young people with a speech and language and communication need are significantly at risk of literacy difficulties because language and literacy support each other. Without underlying language skills, students, students can't effectively access the curriculum and attainment targets are therefore at risk. As students with a speech and language and communication need gain half as many GCSEs at A star to C grades as their peers. So we want you to now think about um, 
a student in your class that you're perhaps struggling with slightly, um, somebody that causes you, causes you concerns. They might be presenting with challenging behaviour, um, not listening, being lazy. And I want you to think, could it be um, a language difficulty? So it may be that the student you're thinking about um, doesn't listen or pay attention. Um, underneath the surface, it may be that they are struggling with the language, that the language is too complex for them. It may be that you have a student that doesn't do as they're told. Um, it, this may be because they haven't actually understood the instruction. It may be that you have a student that doesn't ask for clarification or doesn't ask for help. That may be because they don't realise they haven't understood or they can't ask those clarification questions. You may have a student that's not very good at explaining why they've done something, possibly because they can't construct those sentences or those narratives. And you may have students that interrupt or speak in an inappropriate way. And it may be that they're not good at reading those social situations or using the appropriate social communication skills. So what we're not saying is that every student that you have that has behaviour difficulties has an underlying language difficulty. That's obviously not the case, but um, what, we, what we are saying is it might be. So just something to be aware of um, when you're thinking about the students that you're, that you're working with. Now we're going to show you a video, a um, young person called Lily Farrington, who actually has developmental language disorder herself. Um, and she's made a video um, which just explains a little bit about what developmental language disorder is and what it feels like to have it. So. I am going to share. Diagnosed with developmental language disorder when I was 15 years old. It's a condition that affects people's abilities in understanding and or using spoken language. And it affects two in every classroom of 30. With some people it's obvious as it affects their speech sounds, but for me my DLD is invisible. This is because my speech sounds are normal although I can quite often muddle up my words. No one knows what causes it, but it's a neurodevelopmental disorder and is usually genetic, and my sister and dad have it too. It's the most common learning disability that no one has heard of. When I found out, I was angry because teachers had told me off my whole life for not paying attention. I always found it so hard to understand words and instructions the other kids never seem to struggle to form a sentence and to express themselves the way that I do. I always knew I was different and I finally know why. When people talk to me, it feels like the words are like Nerf bullets and instead of going into your brain, they just bounce off. It feels like you have to catch the words as they're spoken, but they're falling so fast you can't catch them all and you're missing out on what's been said. Sometimes I'll zone out and it's like my head is full of clouds and I'll click back into place and I don't know what's been going on. People think that once I find a way to help my developmental language disorder, it will go away, but that's not the case. It's not like a broken leg or a cold, so I'm stuck with it forever. And that's OK. My dad said it feels like a gift. It changes the way we see the world. So, how can I recognise a student with speech and language communication need in my classroom? Thinking about, could it be understanding? Could it be with using language, so spoken language? Or could it in fact be both? Let's start with recognising a student with difficulties understanding language. 
perhaps they present with a lack of awareness, or just a general lack of awareness of what's going on around them. Relying on routine, gesture, or watching others to know what to do. So those students are always a few seconds behind before they start a task, looking around what they're supposed to be doing. Maybe they are presenting with behaviour difficulties, such as not following instructions. Perhaps they're masking the fact they don't really know what to do. So that student can in fact be very active, taking up quite a lot of your attention, or in fact be really quiet and withdrawn, and not really demonstrating that they're really struggling with the work until the written uh, work is actually presented to you and you discover how much they've misunderstood. Maybe they're the students who are only really following the last part of a long instruction. They're struggling to remember it all, so all they're really remembering is the last thing that they, that they heard you say. Sometimes they might just repeat what's been said to them without actually really understanding it. Maybe their answers are completely inappropriate or just slightly off. and haven't quite understood what you've asked them to do. They might also be very verbal, but the actual content of what they're saying is limited. So they might be using what we call a great deal of social or stereotype speech. Or it's just a lot of thingy or non-specific words and can end up walking away feeling a little bit confused that you haven't really understood what they've just tried to tell you. And these are also the students who are going to struggle to understand implied meaning, sarcasm and non-literal language. So those things that you might say as a joke in the classroom to the rest of the students, they might misunderstand, take a little bit literally. And this also, of course, affects reading material as well. They may also be struggling to learn new vocabulary. There is some research out there which suggests that children and students with DLD might need to hear a word 36 times before they actually can remember it. So I'm just going to go briefly through recognising a student with difficulties using language. So they may make heavy use of gesture, other non-verbal communication, pointing, using their face to try and explain something to you. <clears throat> they may have difficulties in expressing themselves with their peers, and obviously that's going to affect, um, affect them um, socially and it's going to affect them emotionally because it's very difficult when you're trying to build relationships with peers, but you don't have the language to express yourself. They may be disruptive in speaking situations, so they know they find it difficult. So they might be thinking, well, you know, if I'm if I'm as disruptive as possible, I might get excluded, so I don't have to join in with this. And they may stick to preferred topics and phrases because those are easier and more familiar. So they may forget words, they misuse words, or they may use empty words, as Nick was explaining earlier. So thingy, what's it, doing, rather than the more specific vocabulary that, that, um, that they needed to use. Yeah, they may be socially isolated or choose younger students as, as friends because it's easier to talk to someone who's younger because they've got, you know, that there's less sophisticated language that's needed when you're talking to someone that's younger than yourself. They may struggle to respond when they're chosen to answer a question. Um, and give those modelled explanations. So they're kind of trying to tell you something and they're going round the houses because they can't quite get to the point because it's very difficult for them to either use the sentences correctly or just get the right vocabulary in there. And they may sound immature in their use of grammar and vocabulary. So <clears throat> what can we do to support these students? I hear you asking. What we've done is we've given you 10 top tips and um, we're just going to go through those now and hopefully they will be helpful for you to think about how to support these students. Right then, our first top tip. Number one, give extra time. Time is absolutely vital for these students. They need extra time in lots of different ways. So first of all, they need time to process what you've said. Um, often we'll use um, a 10 second rule. So to be able to give them 10 seconds 
to process the instruction or the question that you've asked them. And we, all, we often say repeat it rather than rephrase it. If you repeat it, um, that means they don't have to go back to the beginning and, and start to process another, another question or another instruction um, if you've rephrased it. So it's better to repeat than to rephrase unless you know they really haven't understood the first time and then you may need to rephrase it to make it easier. They need time to organise their own ideas um, and time to get things down on paper. So time, that's a really that's a really vital one. Number two, be visual. So um, writing things down, it's obvious, but making sure that you're writing things down on the whiteboard, you're writing things down on um, paper that they may have. Um, so making sure you just you just write things down, underlining keywords so that you're helping to focus them on what's important. And similarly, it's the same kind of principle when you're highlighting keywords and using different colours, you may want to use different colours for different parts of speech. Um, so if you're using all the same colour for nouns, and verbs and adjectives, for example, um, using drawings, using diagrams, just making sure that everything is visual and that you are using that that um, that modality. Um, using keyword slides um, with bullet points so it's simple to read, um, and just giving demonstrations as much as possible. Number three, modify your language. So we know it's important to keep your sentences short. Um, and slowing down your rate of talking is also really helpful, which gives them time again to process what you said. Pausing between instructions, so making sure that they have understood and followed the first instruction before you give the second instruction is also really good practice. Um, again, same thing, giving one instruction at a time and making sure that you've checked for understanding, which is another one of our tips for later. Um, using gestures and signs if that's appropriate and that's needed. Um, being aware of figurative language, so language that's not literal. We're not saying don't use it, but we're just saying be aware of when you are using it and checking that that is, that is understood. Um, and again, if you've got students that are struggling with their expressive language, being able to repeat back their attempts clearly gives them a nice model so that they can then attempt it um, better for the next time. Number four is get practical. So using that multi-sensory approach, we know that students with language difficulties are often not auditory learners. So using that kinesthetic modality and the visual as much as you can is going to be really helpful for them and being aware that auditory may not be a strength. Demonstrating the task, getting students involved and encouraging group and pair work. Often when, when, um, when students were asked, students with developmental languages sort of were asked what what's helpful for you at, at school and what do you want your teachers to do one of the things they asked was to um to work in groups and to work in pairs so that they're getting the support from those other other students and number five is use frameworks frameworks are um useful in many ways for many different tasks First of all, they help to organise students' thoughts and tasks. Um, so we've got things like task management boards, um, story grids, sentence frameworks, sentence starters and using mind maps. So the, 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 the example on this stage is, is just planning a story. So thinking about the, the parts of the story that you want to remember and not, and not miss out. Um, and uh, so you're thinking about who, where, what, um, what were the problems um, and what are the setbacks, what's the help and what's the resolution and ending. So you're just structuring that a little bit for the student. So this is just an example of a task, um, a task board. So thinking about what does the student need, whether they fill that in or you fill that in, is depending on the student's kind of needs. Um, and then you've got your what do I need to do? Um, your three kind of things that, that need to happen, anything else that's important to remember and a reward if that's appropriate and how long the tasks should should last for and, and when you're going to go and check that they've done it. This is a kind of a similar one, um, 
Um, so, but it just helps to structure what you're teaching. So you've got, the, I know this, I want to know it, what have I learnt? And then a couple of tasks there, which just help the student to think about how much is needed rather than just being um, presented with a blank sheet of paper um, that they're not sure you know, where to start with. So this is quite similar to the one on our first page. It's, it's just a way of um, structuring a story. And here we just have some sentence starters for different um, activities, for different types of um, um, lessons that you're using. So if you're comparing and contrasting, using those ones at the bottom there, um, giving examples. So using, so just giving them um, those options for vocabulary that they can use. Sentence stems. Um, this is just this is a science one um, where they have to where you're giving them the words on the left hand side and actually giving them a really good amount of structure on the right hand side so they don't have to make the whole sentence up, but actually they're putting in those keywords which are important. Tip number six, <clears throat> encouraging use of strategies in the classroom, strategies to support comprehension. So making sure that you are offering an ask friendly classroom. Often students with DLD uh, are too embarrassed to ask for help or ask you to repeat something because they're worried you're going to think they weren't listening. Actually, they were listening really, really hard. They just didn't understand or they didn't remember everything that you said. And so that takes us on to the next strategy. There are some students with DLD who also have auditory memory difficulties. So encouraging uh, memory strategies are, is really, really important too. So being able to write things down, being able to visualize uh, when they're uh, visualize what the language that they're hearing. So uh, really accessing that much stronger visual modality as opposed to the auditory modality. Rehearsing things, so saying it over and over again, what is it I need to do? Uh, in order to remember my homework, etc., that sort of thing. Encouraging that and demonstrating it and model it in the classroom. Uh, being able to paraphrase as well, that be able to say what I need to do in my own words, or tell me what we've just been learning about today, or what is it that I've asked you to do, tell me in your own words. That will really show if the student understands what you're asking them to do. As I say down there, make it okay and normal to ask for help. And then to support them to do this independently, because you want them to be able to do this, whichever lesson that they're in. Pre-teaching new vocabulary where possible. Vocabulary is one of the biggest barriers to a student with DLD accessing learning in the classroom. Because as Kate said earlier, there's a veritable tsunami of new language hitting the student in each lesson that they're going into. And as I said earlier as well, some students with DLD with really significant difficulties need to hear that word so many times before they actually remember and learn it and are then able to retrieve it, to use it in their learning, whether that's spoken or written. There's all sorts of different ways that you can support pre-teaching of vocabulary. Ideally, integrate it into the actual lesson so you're doing it for the whole class um, and sort of highlighting there are different uh, methods and programs to help you identify those key words, often referred to as tier two, with some tier three words that are essential for the student to understand that topic. And there are different things such as word webs and mind maps, being able to link it to the words that they already know, and then practicing and practicing those new words until they're actually overlearned, sharing those with parents so they can reinforce them at home as well. Here are some examples of word webs that you can use to teach vocabulary. And notice that the way we uh, speech therapists would encourage you is you're not just teaching the meaning, but you're actually teaching all sorts of different elements of the way we actually understand a word and then that's the way we store it in our heads. So we might be thinking of synonyms and antonyms, if it's a noun, the parts of that, different meanings and multiple meanings, ways of describing, what do we do with it? What category does it belong to? What kind of word is it? Is it a noun? Is it a verb? And on our later web, we're actually going to, uh, perhaps not this one, but again, it's a different way. It's a very visual way, notice as well, of describing a word's meaning. And as the student gets used to, do, used to using these, they can personalise them and emphasise those elements of meaning that, mean, that are more meaningful for them to help them to remember them. 
Here, this is one uh, which also, instead of just telling you what part of speech, you might put it into a sentence as well. So a typical sentence to exp uh, which also gives, so it's giving context for that word and that particular meaning. As you can see, there are many different ways to do this. All visual, very helpful. And mind maps too, brilliant way of representing information for a student with speech and language communication need. They're very visual, but also very systematic in their use of color, words and icons and symbols to represent meaning. Tip number eight, checking for understanding. Check they understand that new vocabulary. We're not saying don't use figurative language or language with implied meaning because it's important the student is exposed to this, but make sure that you explain it and you check for understanding. And that's both in the language that you use in the classroom and the language that they're exposed to in writing and reading. Highlighting those words and being aware of words can have multiple meanings and particularly sub in subject specific meanings. For example, the word solution. The word solution would often be thought of in general terms as being uh, the answer to a problem. But of course, in chemistry, it's got quite a different meaning. Again, thinking about those tier two words, which are often termed cross curricular. So often these can be words that the student is likely to encounter in, across uh, different lessons. And these can be words such as um, analyze, explain, classify, justify, describe. Uh, we're saying as speech and language therapists for those students with DLD, speech and language communication needs, don't assume the student understands what these mean, understands what these mean. And also making sure they understand the homework task. Uh, most students now are accessing homework via your Google Classroom or your Moodle, but sometimes that student would benefit from that extra support to be able to discuss it with you and really make sure that they understand what to do. Tip number nine. Do it again. Repetition is key. Overlearning is key for students with speech, language and communication need. So recapping previous learning, perhaps much more than you would do normally with a, uh, with a student who doesn't present with the same difficulties. Repeating activities more than once, because this will help make that learning much more secure. And tip number 10, keep going, knowing, of course, that we're all trying to make a difference. So, a practical activity. You've got concerns that a student has underlying speech and language communication needs, and you're going to be teaching or supporting them in a lesson, a science lesson, or perhaps a lesson in your own subject. What are you going to plan to put in place for the next lesson, and what might be your longer term actions? Pause the video here and jot down some thoughts. Here are some ideas that we put together. Select key vocabulary that the student really has to understand in order to be able to access that lesson. Pre-teach it. Think about those word webs we showed earlier. How can you represent this word visually to really help that student understand and remember that word? Print out, if you can, the PowerPoint for the lesson so the student can have it in front of them. This means that they're less reliant on that auditory memory and processing everything just through that auditory channel. They've actually got something written down to back up that they can refer back to if they need to. Think about how you word your instructions um, for the actual task. Thinking of things like following the order of mention, first, next, then, keeping it as simple and clear as possible. Consider the pace of the lesson and the importance of taking that opportunity to reiterate the key points. Again, repetition being so important for students with language needs. Give the student time to process the language. So, for example, if you're asking questions to the student, uh, to, the, to the class as a whole, perhaps you wouldn't pick that student first. If they, are, if they are putting up their hand, but perhaps pick some other students first so that they have, that student has time to formulate what they want to say, but also to hear that language modelled by other students as well. Again, we've talked about giving written instructions for homework, making sure that they really understand what they need to do. 
but also and also uh, as Kate referred to earlier, thinking about is there any kind of frameworks or um, things like word webs, but mostly the frameworks or structure to help support that uh, student with their uh, with the written elements of the, um, your lesson. Thank you very much for listening and we hope you found that really useful. There is loads of extra reading out there and we have put it together in our slides of uh, tips and if you want to learn a little bit more about developmental language disorder and uh, its impact on a student uh, in a secondary school context. So I'm just going to flip through these. Of course, you'll have copies of these slides so you can investigate as much as you would like to. So just very briefly, we're, we're just going to go back over the aims of the webinar and we just really hope that uh, we've achieved them. So the first aim was to understand the impact of having speech, language and communication needs. And, and we hope that you've kind of got a bit of a, a bit more of an idea about um, <clears throat> how hard it can be for some students with these needs. Um, and to be able to recognise those students with speech, language and communication needs. We hope that that's made you think not necessarily to be able to recognise every student, but to kind of have a bit more of an idea of thinking about could it be language? And the final one was to consider those strategies for supporting students with speech, language and communication needs. And we hope that those 10 top tips have been helpful for you and we'd really appreciate it if you could think about maybe using two or three of those um, in the um, lessons that you're going to be doing in the next few weeks just to practice and just get a feel for it. Thank you so much for listening and if you have got any further questions or if you'd like to contact us um, we've just put some um, contact details for the school age um, coordinators for all the different areas of Warwickshire. There you go. Thank you very much. Bye. Goodbye.